immediately. Well, I would say the main image is the first, the highest per products. You don't have to do everything. Look, there's over 30 different ad placements you can, you can do on Amazon. Most people are only, only aware of maybe five to 10 of those. So yeah. we finally figured out, it's like, okay, it's our processes, it's our systems that are broken. The philosophy, the strategies, they're, they're correct. We're just not implementing them consistently. So now... Uh, Hello everyone, welcome. Today, I have one of the OGs when it comes to Amazon. He's a co-founder of Canopy Management, which is probably one of the first few Amazon agencies that have existed since then. Hello, Brian, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for having me. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of questions since Brian is uh, having that knowledge that can answer all the doubts that we have. And since the Q4 is already near, so I think these tips are going to help the audience a lot. So right now I was watching a couple of your videos and you were talking about manage experiments. So yeah. at this point of time with this Q4, so far, I mean, it is just few months. So what do you think how sellers and brands can take advantage of manage experiments? Well, so managing, management experiments has always been something I've liked to use because it provides the A-B split testing that we need to do in order to improve conversion rate. So it's a conversion rate optimization technique. Um, there are no other platforms um, on the market that work with native Amazon data and provide real-time uh, A-B split testing. Um, there are, uh, there's, there's certainly some, some sites where you can take an audience poll, almost like a focus group, for to compare images, but that is not A-B split testing. That is simply just saying, hey, here's a popularity contest for your images. It may, you know, 20 main images down to five so that you can start testing it, but you'll still need to use Amazon experiments in order to do true A-B split testing. What experiments does is it allows you to, uh, to compare every other shopper that comes through that sees your listing um, you can test as far as, um, hey, here's the existing image, main image, and here's a different main image. Um, and so you're you can, comparing uh, one image against a second image. Uh, you can also do that against your title, and uh, you can also do that against your A-plus content. Now, recently, Amazon introduced also the ability to, uh, to split test bullet points as well as... Um, description field. So it's it's definitely progressing. Certainly the bullet points is a huge one, especially the first three bullet points. Generally, uh, if you look at where most of your traffic starts, which is on a mobile platform, uh, the main image is crucial. The secondary images, I would say, are probably, well, I would say the main image is the first, the highest priority. Your title is going to be your second highest priority. Your secondary images are your third highest priority for primarily for mobile and for a lot of visual people. <laughs> and then followed by that, you're gonna have the first three bullet points of, uh, of the content of the product listing, followed by either A plus content or description. So those are the sequence that we tend to work out. Um, it's, it's not uncommon for myself and my team to run experiments where we are split testing different images for uh, in four week blocks. That's all I feel is necessary as long as you've got enough traffic in order to be able to run an AB split test on through Amazon experiments. Mm -hmm. I run four week sessions and I run those back to back. So I don't just do it once and say, okay, cool. It's, it it okay. didn't tell me anything. I run it for a full, you know, I'm running it for years. Um, as far as I just continue, just continue to run uh, A-B split tests because I know ultimately what I'm looking for is the incremental gain that I get. I might get a 0.1% increase in conversion rate one month, but I might get a 2.5% increase the next month. When you add those up across a year, you could be well ahead of the conversion rate that any of your competitors have. And all of a sudden, now you're a market dominator simply because you put in this monthly effort. Okay, cool. Uh, I was I was looking at one of your video where you described about the five second rule. Yeah. So, would you like to describe a little bit about that? 
Sure. Uh, uh, five second rule is simply just a, it's an arbitrary number that is within the, the three to eight second standard um, attention. In other words, uh, psychological studies go in and say, OK, in today with people using mobile phones and being easily distracted with all kinds of media, TikTok videos and and television and cell phones and, you know, digital billboards and everything is we only tend to allow ourselves to pay attention to anything for just a few seconds. And so I just use that as a five second rule. The second thing on that is the second, the five second rule applies to what's the result, not simply do they see or look at an object, whether it's an image or a title or a bullet point, it's what do they get out of that five seconds? What I'm looking for is I want them to understand within that five seconds, what's in it for me as a shopper if i buy your product or buy your service and uh, have that have that clear understanding of essentially what's in it for me within that five seconds if i can't do that then essentially whoever the vendor is or the seller or the brand if they make me work for it i'm, ver I'm i have a much higher chance of skipping to somebody else who does or losing my attention and i start looking at something else and so you've got just a few seconds with every single image, every single, you know, your title, every single bullet point, you have just a few seconds to answer that question. Cause ultimately I want the shopper to tell themselves, you know, mentally, it's just like, Ooh, I want that. Ooh, I want that. Ooh, I want that. If you can get them, get them, get them, you know, into that yes mode of, this is something that is right for me. This is something that, that I understand what's in it for me. I want that for me. You sold them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the attention grabbing thing should be five seconds, like less than five seconds. Yeah. Okay. Since Q4 is... Well, and actually, uh, technically, <laughs> so you've got attention, you've got hook, and you've got conversion. Okay. Right? So the, the attention is what's going to catch the eye. If you have a whole list of mm -hmm. uh, competing images, for instance, uh, especially on mobile, when people are simply just scrolling through, it's... Yeah. it's you have got to stand out from your competition by having an image that has a high contrast, whether that's color, shape, you know, pa you know, pattern, um, uh, anything that, that whether it's cluttered or simple, uh, you know, a lot of white space. These are things that as long as you're going essentially the opposite of what your competition is doing, then you're not going to blend into your, the list of competitive images mm -hmm. and therefore you're going to catch the shopper's eye you're going to grab their attention initially because that your image stands out from everybody else and it's all just it's simply there's no one right answer it's like oh always go with red right that's a very outdated uh, marketing mechanism saying oh use this color no it's how do you do the opposite how do you stand out among your competitive set and then that translates into the hook the hook is what's the benefit or feature that uh, seems unique to this product and that I want. That's when your your five seconds starts kicking in. Okay, got it. I mean that was a great explanation about it. So with the Q four near, uh, I mean obviously we have seen a drastic drop in traffic conversion. I mean how do you structure the budgeting before sales and after sales? For budgeting, okay. Well, so from a budgeting standpoint, um, if we're looking at specifically advertising, is assuming that you are not just now launching ads, that you have got some kind of history, any brand should be looking at refining their budget, focusing their budget, redirecting their budget to what has the highest conversion rate. I always lead with what's the conversion rate? Because the conversion rate tells me 90% of the story of whether or not a product is selling or it's not selling because ultimately if I have what I should be doing is instead of simply just having scattered advertising and trying to just blanket everything so that I get as many eyeballs as possible. Once I start getting, when it gets really competitive, Q4 prime days, cyber week, this is when it gets really expensive. If you're still just doing this shotgun scatter, right? You're just trying to address to too wide of an audience. You've got to focus in so that your ad budgets are focused in on the products that have the highest conversion rate that you sell, the ad types, whether it's sponsored products, sponsored brands, sponsored brand video, um, sponsored display, DSP, 
you know, whichever ones are uh, producing the highest conversion rate for your products, you don't have to do everything. Look, there's over 30 different ad placements you can, you can do on Amazon. Most people are only, only aware of maybe five to 10 of those. So yeah. it, rather than simply just turn something on and just let it run and hope that it works, that's a bad and a very expensive strategy, unless you just make everything a really low bid. And then that's usually pretty safe ineffective i mean or less effective i should say but certainly safer from a profitability standpoint so if you if you don't have time to do anything then run low budget or low bid uh campaigns with a, a i would say a moderate to high budget because it should be profitable at that point but focusing in on the highest converting product the highest converting ad type and the highest converting target so that could be uh, a search term, it could be a keyword, it could be a product targeting, it could be a campaign or a uh, category targeting. Um, just pay attention to what has an above average conversion rate, which means brands need to make choices like, look, I'm getting sales from this keyword, but it's not profitable. So either you tune your keyword uh, bidding so that it, it becomes profitable with the exception of if you're trying to organically rank for that particular keyword, and it only should be like two or three of those that you're doing that to, then everything else should be focused on what has an above average conversion rate among your advertising. That's where I focus my budget. That's where I put all my money into competitive prime day, cyber week, Q4. Okay. Cool. So how do you structure the defense campaigns for brands, especially when maximum competitors are increasing their bids so high? So how do we structure our own defense? From a defense standpoint, I usually try to just occupy real estate. Um, and I don't need to occupy real estate 100% in order to, do, to make it more expensive for my competitors. If I have multiple products and I have products that are not within the same parent, in other words, it doesn't work if you simply just say, oh, I'm going to advertise, um, uh, you know, a sister, you know, a, a sister product that's a child of the same parent because Amazon's only going to show one of them under those conditions. So it's not like, oh, my red color product is my best seller, but then I've got blue and green and black colors are my child, you know, uh, or the other child uh, products and I'm advertising those, those aren't going to show unless it's a unique placement and a unique search where it shows the green one instead of the red one, for instance, they have to be uh, a standalone or they have to be among different uh, parent, uh, parent products, parent ASINs. So what that typically means is I'm going to make sure that on my own product detail page, that if I've got other products that are not child, uh, child relevant, that I'm running ads on those. And, uh, and I'm using sponsor products, sponsor brand, sponsor display. I'm using everything that I can on those. Uh, certainly with the expansion of things like sponsor brand video in multiple locations, I'm going to make sure that I've got some kind of a, a quick 15 second benefit what's in it for me kind of video that can run both on search results as well as product detail pages on, on brand store pages. And then um, I'm also using other tactics as far as if I have multiple products and I can bundle anything, I'm using the virtual bundle, bundles in order to make sure that I am pushing down real estate below my main product section so that I'm pushing down competitive ads farther down the page so that my shoppers are less distracted by that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to okay. bid enough that I don't own it 100%. I don't own any ads placements hundred percent of the time because if you're doing that then you're paying a premium to defend your ad to defend your product listing and that's probably going to get expensive okay got it again what uh, would be some of the retargeting strategies that every seller has to have i mean that should be a must have for every sellers yeah well i mean from a from a retargeting standpoint you have uh, of course you can use sponsor display um, uh, remarketing, retargeting ads, you can focus those in based off of, um, you know, within a certain amount of time, you know, certainly if they haven't made a purchase 
within the first seven days is your kind of your critical sweet spot. Um, if you are selling over a hundred thousand a month on Amazon, you definitely should be leveraging DSP. DSP is the demand side platform, Amazon's second ad platform, which is more like the enterprise level of sponsored display ads. And so it's, it's a lot more powerful, um, than what you're going to get from a standard sponsored display ad, but mm -hmm. sponsor, even sponsored display ads, um, I would, I would start testing now from a retargeting standpoint never start new experiments, new, well, I shouldn't say new, um, like Amazon experience, but new campaign experiments, new campaign testing, new campaign theories during when it's especially hot, like during prime week, during cyber week, okay. uh, you definitely don't want to run it then because you're just, you're, you're paying a premium for, uh, for, for the education of did it work in this moment? I would rather, in fact, I would rather, just from a general visibility standpoint, I would rather have very focused campaigns just on those high converting products, high converting ad types, high converting targets. And then I would put in a layer under that of low bid auto campaign, low bid broad match keyword campaigns, uh, you know, low bid sponsored brand keyword campaigns, something that is a low enough bid that I know that I'm going to at least break even on my profitability or I'm even going to make a profit. But what that does is they run less, in other words, it has far fewer impressions, but on peak traffic days, like prime days, cyber, uh, you know, um, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Surprise Tuesday, those are the big three days for cyber. Plus, of course, the fall prime day is you're going to have a lot more traffic, a lot more shopping traffic. And what you're going to find is competitors within your niche are going to fall off They run out of inventory because they did so well. They run out of budget because they're not, you know, they're not being flexible in their budget throughout the day. And that's going to open up our opportunities for any of your that layer of low bid campaigns to then start running and they're running inexpensively. So it's a great way to pick up all that extra traffic in the afternoons and evenings of those days when everybody else has left the building, if you will. Okay, so uh, since we talked about campaign creation during Q4, uh, so do you think launching a new product in this type of the situation during the sales is a good idea or expensive? Uh, you can. I mean, if you can lock in things as far as like a prime exclusive deal or lightning deal um, or some kind of significant uh, coupon, you know, something that grabs the attention from your competitor coupons. In other words, if your competitors all have, you know, 5% off coupons, you don't come in with a 5% coupon. You come in with a 20% coupon. You come in with a $20 off coupon, something aggressive like that. Typically that you're expecting when you launch a product to, to be discounted on your product in order to get sales velocity, right? That's one methodology. Yeah. You could support that by saying, Hey, I've got, I've got high traffic days. Let me run, any kind of promotions temporarily that creates that same kind of like, oh, wow, that's a deal, that attention grabbing deal where people actually notice that your coupon code, as an example, significantly stands out from your competition. It's all relative again to your competition. If everybody's doing a $10 coupon, a $20 coupon may not hit the way you want it to, but it is certainly feasible in order to launch during these high traffic days if you're willing to move sales velocity without the prospect of, oh, I'm going to clean up on profitability. Okay. So uh, you have talked about DSP. So yeah. DSP, what should we consider? Should we use it on the top of the funnel and the middle or how do you consider it doing? You know, I mean, it, there's a lot of experiments. It depends on the products, it depends on your target audience as far as mm -hmm. whether or not you're running on, um, you know, running ads through, you know, a Twitch channel or, you know, some kind of other, you know, like a gamer, you know, gamer channel, some, some specific partner of Amazon. So it really kind of depends on what niche you're in and who your target audience is. Uh, the most effective and the most reliable that we find is the retargeting. Retargeting for those um, shoppers who have not purchased, who have visited either your product or a competitor's product, but have not made a purchase, running those ads for uh, just a few days, 
you know, um, typically the way you, you set it up so that your so that that particular person only sees your ad a certain number of times. You don't want to have that unlimited. You only want to have that like maybe, you know, three or four times they see your ad and it's within like, say, a seven day. If they are if you're running DSP ads for, from a, almost like a subscribe and save um, where you are. If somebody bought your product, for instance, you know, a month ago and it's a supplement, it's a 30 day mm -hmm. supplement, yeah. then generally you want to be running. Now, we actually found uh, this is kind of counterintuitive is you would think it's like, oh, if somebody bought a 30 day supply for me, then I should start running ads at 30 days. But it actually doesn't work that well, because frankly, people don't use them on the on the pace that the, the, the instructions say. So usually what we find is like the 45, 60, 90 days. Um, are typically going to be the ones that are more effective uh, at getting a shopper to come back and repurchase that product again. Yeah. So we have talked about advertising, some strategies. Now let's talk about canopy management because we know it is okay. one of the oldest agencies that is. It's not really. Right now. No, I wouldn't say it's the <laughs> oldest. Um, you know, we we were not early adopters, so we had. Uh, you know, uh, of course, I had the, the PPC Scope software and the Sponsor Products Academy course. Those mm -hmm. were all predecessors. So usually people, you, most companies start out with an agency and then they roll out things like, oh, here's our software now. Here's our training materials now. Well, we did the opposite. <laughs> and so <laughs> we've, uh, the Canopy has only been around for about four and a half years, which is, is reasonable for the Amazon space, uh, for sure. Definitely not one of the first ones. Uh, first software, first course, yeah, but not first agency. But we have been so um, so aggressive about making sure that we we hire well. You know, we we probably interview uh, twenty to thirty people in order to find one that is a good fit for what we what we want, the quality level that we want within the company. Uh, we now have over. It's over 100 employees. I don't know if it's 105, 110, something like that worldwide. We are, we're a 100% virtual company, which is awesome, especially during the, the COVID years here where it was forced. Um, we didn't miss a beat. But we've, we've nailed down as far as our processes, our systems. Um, we don't use um, AI, uh, you know, machine, le machine learning and software mm -hmm. in order to manage, to hyper manage uh, ad campaigns. Uh, we, we use a certain amount of automation in order to help us gain insights. We primarily rely on our heavy human teams in order to provide uh, market and target audience insights and decisions that there's no software out there that does that currently within the Amazon space that is. Um, and so we rely pretty heavily on the fact that we have uh, we struggled on I, I'll be straight up is like our first year um, I probably I don't know I feel like I, I broke my nose half a dozen times just face planting on the ground because I, I screwed up you know too many times and it wasn't until we finally figured out it's like okay it's our processes it's our systems that are broken the philosophy the strategies they're they're correct we're just not implementing them consistently so now um, it's been, gosh, I don't know, three, three and a half years now that we actually got those systems into place and we always continue to refine those. And we have a very collaborative team environment um, so that we can provide to our clients uh, a high level of performance and consistency. Consistency year over year makes a huge difference from simply like, oh, we, it just, we, we did really well because it was Q4. You know, like, okay, now that's, that's, that's easy. Right. What do you do when it's their off season? You know, how yeah. do you, how do you grow profitability when everything on the on the marketplace says you shouldn't be selling? <laughs> so that's that's where yeah. our experience makes a difference. So so uh, at at what point do you think a brand should consider hiring an agency? I would say usually they 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 should have they should understand they should have at least been getting a certain amount of sales. They've kind of proven their business model with their product. Uh, ideally, they've got more than one product. I would say probably at least, you know, minimum two, probably more like three or more products. Um, I know that for uh, for Canopy, 
we we don't typically work with with any agency or with any uh, brand, I should say, with any brand that isn't already selling on average at least thirty thousand a month on Amazon. In other words, they have a uh, they have their own team in place um, for bringing new product to market. They have a product that is actually shown to be a winner on Amazon. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that they've gotten everything right. Most of the time we go in and we have a, a huge list of changes we re recommend <clears throat> in order to increase visibility, indexing, uh, conversion rate, of course, is probably one of the biggest ones we have an impact on. And then that allows our ad teams in order to grow the sales and uh, grow the overall sales. <clears throat> Typically, the ones that fall below that minimum of the 30000 a month are those who have a track record of selling off of Amazon, for instance, Shopify, Walmart, whatever the case is. We do manage Walmart as well, but Amazon is certainly the one that we do. Um, I, think we're, I think we're somewhere in the... Um, I know that we've, we've over the past, you know, since the company's founded, we, we've managed over uh, 2 billion in sales on Amazon. Um, so I would like to say that we've got quite a bit of experience in this space. <laughs> um, we do probably half, we do five or 600 million in sales um, annually uh, of our for our clients that is um, and so that requires a lot of bulletproof systems um, a lot of experience in order to make the right decisions um, be the ability to look year over year and say even though X came up whether that is pandemic or Amazon stopping advertising or Amazon kicking off certain types of sellers or uh, account suspensions or you know who knows what else right it, there's always <laughs> yeah. something right and to be able to weather all of those storms requires um, a solid team that is multidisciplinary that can handle a lot of different things whether it's advertising listing optimization uh, account protection some of these and that that formula works pretty well <laughs> you know uh, okay so, yeah. so so uh how, how is your normal client onboarding process looks like like how many team members get involved in one account how does it look like so typically our teams are uh six to seven um staff on, on a team on an ad team and so we'll have that entire team will be working on that account they could be in uh, an analyst role, they could be in a, you know, in a ad decision staging, in other words, they collect the data, they, they interpret, you know, here's, here's what's going on, here's what's working, here's what's not working. Um, uh, here's what the competitors are doing, and we bring that all together in order for, um, so we'll have like a junior level for, you know, data collection and general kind of the runners. We'll have um, the, uh, the standard, uh, I should say the, the lead um, analysts who go through and make um, some of the more critical decisions, especially if something is is not working to plan or we need to uh, leverage or double down on something that's working well. Uh, we have that layer of our lead analysts and then we have more of the, the team leaders, those who are definitely the senior most experienced been with the company since day one you know advanced level they come in and in order to solve the really hard problems they love that um and uh that's just on an ad team and then if there's any kind of you know listing optimization seo conversion rate optimization kind of services that we provide well we have a whole separate team just you know just for those um so it's you may only in working with canopy you may only speak to one or two of the team but there's a whole team behind them you know <laughs> that's operating so wow i mean uh, that was really valuable insights uh, not in terms of agency only but in terms of strategies for the q4 optimization so all sorts of things i'm sure the audience is going to love this content uh thank you so much brian for sharing such valuable knowledge with us uh, do, do you have anything that you want to say to our audience? No, I, I mean, well, yeah, I would say just to reiterate is you're going into Q4. You usually have two concerns. Am I being seen? Is my product being seen? And is it being indexed? You really need to look at, do you need to update your product listing? 
hundred percent of the time you do without question. Like every single time I talk to a brand, it's like, yeah, that needs some changes. Sometimes they're major changes. Sometimes they're minor. Uh, if you're running a plus content, make sure that you are using your uh, extended fields as far as like, you know, the image text fields um, in to their total capability so that you can get indexed and therefore seen for a wider variety of keywords. But always make sure that your messaging is solving the question, what's in it for me if I buy your product? Why should I buy your product? What's in it for me about each individual feature? What's the benefit to me? If you're not answering that, then they will find somebody who will. Wow, that was great insights. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much for coming on our show. It was really a pleasure having you here. Well, thank okay. you for having me.